Tim, thank you very much for those kind words. I was, as was said, the, the first Sea Lord, a most splendid, splendid title. Uh, Mike Jackson, who was head of the army, I know was extremely jealous of it, but I pointed out to him that first landlord didn't have the same <laughs> ring about it. I, I, I've thought about leadership for a very long time, and I thought, well, why should I be entitled actually to speak about it? And, uh, and I think it is because I've been involved in thinking about leadership for so very long. Um, but one of the important things to remember is, although I'll be talking about personal experiences and obviously about the military, um, these things do transfer across into the worlds of commerce uh, and industry. And I know that. I've been a CEO of companies as well as having been a government minister. I've worked in, in government ministries. And I know that these rules, the basis of them, actually apply everywhere. But one thing I did learn from an incident on this ship was that being a good leader you have to be tempered by the fact of having uh, something, a, a major setback and overcoming it and learning from them. Um, one night we were, were landing in, in the Gulf of Aden to intercept terrorists. We were going across an open beach. Um, as a young officer, I hadn't, uh, I hadn't thought it through carefully enough. It was pitch black. I'd misjudged the surf levels and we capsized. We all ended up in the water with all our weapons, uh, radio, ammunition, all our equipment. I pondered our situation, which was not good. Uh, we had the enemy very close by. We only had a couple of operational weapons. To cut a long story short, we were rescued by an armored car patrol that I'd asked the ship to send. Um, and when we were recovered, I was sitting in the wardroom of the sh this particular ship, and my spirits were really lifted because the two senior NCOs on board the ship stuck their head into the wardroom, and, uh, and they said, sir, we know you're pretty low, but we thought you'd get you the message that our boys thank you for looking after them and they'd be proud to follow you again. Um, now, I was exonerated from blame at the board, but actually it was that statement by those men that meant most to me because in the final analysis, leadership is about inspiring those people you're, you're leading, giving them confidence in you, and then a desire to emulate you and it's about evolving a will to serve and making each individual feel that he would do anything rather than actually let you down. In 1971, I went on and doing other jobs. I was navigator of a very small frigate, HMS Russell, a 1,500-ton ship. Uh, we don't make little ones like that anymore. Uh, we were running up the channel in a Force 11. We went over the 100-fathom line, an important, important step when you've got huge storms. Um, and the ship, uh, the ship broached. That's when the, the sea comes from astern. You can see in this picture, that's not of the incident, of course. But that's what happened. It comes from astern. Those of you who yacht, who do a lot of yachting, will know when you get these huge waves up behind you. This was an immense wave came up behind the ship. Um, the ship actually rolled over uh, on, its, uh, on its side, having gone to 67 degrees. I rushed up to the bridge. I was down in the wardroom as this happened. Uh, and as I got up there, a wave broke over the ship. Um, and actually split the ship across the midships, lifted all the boiler safety valves, so huge noise, a screaming noise when the safety valves goes. We lost all our power. We lost our way. There was a fire because in the galley all the oil had gone everywhere and it was all on fire. There was an air of panic on the bridge, uh, understandably, um, uh, and as the first competent officer to get there, the men looked to me um, to see what should be going on. And it's often forgotten, I think, by all of us, in all our jobs and all those in authority, how much subordinates actually watch every move of you? How do you behave? And in a time of danger, uh, it's even more important, clearly, um, because when disaster threatens, you've got to never reveal by any word or any action that you're anything other than totally confident of mastering the situation. I can assure you, you don't bloody feel it. And it was very interesting, the ship's engineer officer who came stumbling up the bridge, he said later that he said it wasn't until he got up the bridge and heard me doing this and these things happening that he felt actually that everything was fine. It wasn't actually fine, but he felt everything was fine. Uh, and inwardly, I have to say inwardly, I felt very far from calm. Uh, from calm. I was extremely fortunate, and I've been fortunate throughout my career, I can't complain, um, that I got my first command of a patrol craft in Hong Kong at the age of 25. I was a little bit slimmer then. Um, this is HMS Yarnton. I had a ship's company of 36, and of course, with that number, you can know every single man individually, but you've got to avoid the danger of trying to be one of the boys. It's no good being one of the boys. They don't want you to be one of the boys. You've got to be the complete master, and yet the complete friend of every person in your ship. You've got to be detached, 
but not disassociated from them. You need to know your people. You've got to be known by them. Uh, it doesn't mean that you should be a martinet, of course, um, and indeed, I, you le often learn most from very bad leaders. I'm sure you're all the same, where you've had bad bosses at times. You learn a hell of a lot from a bad boss, better than a good boss. Basically, your people have to know that you're fair. They have to know they can trust your judgment. My next command after, uh, after, this, after this particular job was the 3,000-ton frigate HMS Ardent, uh, which after some 16 months in command, uh, I took down to the Falklands as part of the operations there. And 33 years ago, it's amazing it's so long ago, on the 21st of May, I ordered my ship to be abandoned, my, my pride and joy, my grey mistress, as we call it in the Navy, because it takes so much of your, of your time. She laid a single anchor, uh, absolutely ablaze, uh, and sinking. We had experienced uh, 17 air attacks uh, over the previous hour. She doesn't look nearly as pretty after a few air attacks, I have to say. Um, uh, I'd been hit by seven bombs, four 1,000-pound bombs and three 500-pound bombs over that nine hours. Uh, we'd been strafed by 30-millimeter cannon fire. I'd lost 22 of my boys, and 50 of them were injured. Um, and the loss of the ship and so many of my people, the prolonged period then on coming home, plus the subsequent board of inquiry, uh, gave me time for a great deal of introspection, as you can imagine. And I've no doubt, as I've touched on before, that I became a better leader because of it. And I've already said, you know, the best leaders are those who have been tempered by overcoming real major setbacks. They've refocused their team. They've shown mental resilience. And so it was quite clear it was, a, it was the correct decision. Um, when I went back to ship, of course, I didn't explain that actually we were going to be extremely vulnerable because you don't do that. Um, uh, and again, it goes back to this thing, you must never blame your boss for something. You've got, to, you've got to take the blame for things that are going wrong. Similarly, if there are errors in your team, you must say to your boss, I've got it wrong. They're your team. You're the ones who have to make them. You don't say Bloggins got it wrong. That is no bloody good at all. It's up to you to make sure your team work properly, and you should take responsibility for it. And actually, competence is, is very important. Uh, people like to think that their boss is highly competent. And I remember going in on the in towards the invasion beach, very misty the night before, in very close formation. I was on the bridge. A succession of people just drifted up. They just wanted reassurance to talk to me. One of them, um, the, our leading club swinger, that's a physical training instructor. I remember having a very long chat with him. He sadly was killed the next day down, down aft. Uh, with, he just had a young child. Um, and again... I go back to this point, in action, people watch you very closely. In a crisis, people watch you very closely. But a knowing people really pays off uh, when things go wrong, and that's important in, in business as well. You do have to be robust at times, obviously. You can't be a pussycat with people. At one stage, one man totally panicked in an attack. He came running up the ladder to the bridge, screaming, abandoned ship, you know, and I had to grab him and give him a good shaking and throw him back down the hole again. But he then went back to his post and, uh, and fought well for the rest of the day. And the seven-week board of inquiry really gives you a chance to question every decision you've made. And at the end, you're either court-martialed or you go on with your career. I was very lucky because I got the Distinguished Service Cross uh, for bravery and led the Victory Parade in the City of London. But I can assure you there were things that I did in that day that I could have done a lot better. And I was a very chastened man. And my understanding of people, I think, grew dramatically. I think my ability to communicate, communicate and the importance of communicating and understand your people uh, was really enhanced. Um, you're always accountable, as I say. They're your people. Uh, you must know how they, how they perform and behave because that reflects absolutely on you.